We, we are going to include in this session some intracranial and extracranial uh, subjects. And to start, I'm uh, happy to ask Alex uh, Piotta, who is one of our neurointerventional uh, guys at MUSC, uh, to give us an update on management of patients with intracranial aneurysms. Alex? Thanks a lot for having me. This is my second year here, and I'm glad to be here. I was fascinated by listening to the vascular surgery talks before me. A lot of the growing pains that we've gone through the last five years looks like they've gone through 10 or 15 years beforehand, and there's a lot of lessons to be shared, although there's different uh, challenges between what they do and what we do. So again, I'm tasked to update you on the management of intracranial aneurysms. It's a big topic. I'm going to go fast. Just brace yourselves. Here are my disclosures, though nothing relevant to this topic. In a quick outline, I'm going to set the stage for the, the uh, debate, which has really been hot the last uh, decade, which has been the two treatment modalities, the gold standard, the old time-honored microsurgical clip versus the endovascular coiling. 2005, I'll review the ICED data, which showed that coiling um, patients who underwent coiling tolerated and had a better outcome than those who underwent clipping. Keep in mind, this is during the time early, early work when this is really first generation crude uh, techniques and devices that we had. I'll update you on the developments of adjunct techniques since that study. And in 2012 now, the BRAT study is the second study comparing clipping to coiling, which also showed a um, benefit to coiling over clipping with these newer second generation devices and techniques. And f even from that time on, we've had rapid uh, advances in evolution. I'll just review and introduce some of those advances. And after that, I'll set you up. You'll think that there's no reason for any surgery. But I'll remind you, as I say, there's still some aneurysms at this point that need to be clipped, and I'll show you some examples. So when evaluating an aneurysm, determining what needs to be ruptured, I'm sorry, determining what needs to be treated, there's several factors we need to consider. We know from the issue study observational data that aneurysm size, as aneurysms increase in size, there's higher risk of rupture over time. But beyond size, there's other things we must consider, like previous subarachnoid history, a family history subarachnoid, tobacco use, location of the aneurysm, post use circulation posing a higher risk for both rupture and death, as well as morphology, spherical versus aneurysms with uh, pseudo blisters on top of them. And why do we treat aneurysms? To prevent subarachnoid hemorrhage, which carries a very high mortality and morbidity. 15% of people will drop dead on the floor, never make it to the hospital. Of those that come to the hospital, a little over 30% will not live. These are just some of the common locations of intracranial aneurysms. Again, here, most of them are saccular as opposed to aneurysms we've seen from the body experience, which have been more fusiform. And again, the time-honored time -honored way to treat this was the microsurgical clipping, which involved an incision behind the hairline, a small front of temporal craniotomy, microsurgical dissection along the skull base. Here's identifying the optic carotid cistern marching along the carotid to the first branch point here, the ACA and the MCA at the carotid terminus, and in this case, marching along along the M1 segment of the MCA until we find this anterior temporal artery aneurysm, and then applying a clip to exclude it from the outside. And in the setting is the operating room with the, micros with the microscope. The newer technique, of course, is the percutaneous endovascular, most commonly through a transfemoral approach. Knowing the anatomy, we can travel from the femoral artery to the arch, and then from the arch to the neck and ultimately up into the intracranial circulation with a relatively stiff guide for support in the neck, and then more flexible, longer intermediate guides, which can be advanced to the skull base, and then our smaller working microcatheter actually to travel into the aneurysm. And coilimization involves deploying coils of which we have hundreds to choose from different sizes, shapes, thicknesses. Some are bioactive, it would swell um, in the uh, tissue, to essentially fill the aneurysm from the inside out and have it be occluded. Of course, this is in the setting of a biplane angiography suite. So the debate's been hot, coiling versus clipping. And the first um, data that we had was presented in 2005 and involved um, just over 2,000 patients, randomized these are patients that had an aneurysm that was deemed to be amenable to both surgery and coiling equally. And those patients randomized. And patients who were clipped had a, uh, other words, those who went into surgery had a higher likelihood of being either death or dependent at one year. And again, that was with the first generation, which is now rudimentary techniques, which I'll show, which is essentially unassisted coilimization without the use of adjuncts. So here's just a schematic, the aneurysm along, the, uh, it's a narrow necked aneurysm coming off the sidewall of the parent vessel, and then just distal to it, we see a perforated artery, which you want to preserve. Acts as the aneurysm with a microcatheter, insert the coils, keep inserting coils until you get a nice occlusion of the aneurysm. 
once that's occluded, both the thrombus as well as the coil mass will, will uh, form a scaffold over which the endothelium can grow, and essentially that causes um, vessel repair and long-term durability. Here's just another view of the vessel um, unassisted coil embolization, and then a dual catheter technique with a, small, with a, a larger guide. You can have two microcatheters introducing two coils at the same time that can form more complex three-dimensional shapes. And that was essentially it at the time of the ISAT study. Um, but again, remembering that those patients tolerated endovascular treatment uh, better even back then. Since then, we have much better tools. A broad neck aneurysm poses a particular challenge. Why is that? As you start introducing coils, there's not much holding them in place. There can be coil prolapse that can activate platelets, which can lead to insight to uh, thrombosis and parent vessel occlusion, such in this case of an anterior communicating artery complex, two vessels coming in, two vessels coming out. That's a uh, tough bifurcation for us. And you can see here, uh, the vessels uh, highlighted on the right and the blue, we've lost those branches, now we have to work hard to get those back open. In addition to having insight to your local thrombosis, some of the coil can actually herniate and fly downstream, which is always unnerving. Here's an example of peacock aneurysm. You can see with the yellow arrow, one of the smaller coils, one of the fishing coils, flew out of the aneurysm and traveled distally. U ultimately, you can see the filling defect and the wet shape distribution of that distal MCA territory, which would then lead to an infarct. All things, obviously, we'd like to avoid. How do we do that? The balloon remodeling, which was introduced in 2005 and really the last five years, has really taken off, again, after the ISAT study. You um, deposit a um, deflated balloon catheter across the aneurysm neck and then select your aneurysm microcatheter, inflate your balloon that effectively seals that aneurysm, effectively creates a no neck. Then you can insert your coils. Again, in the same manner, achieve a nice um, a packing density, achieve a uh, aneurysm occlusion. So you can deflate your balloon and make sure that there's stability. In other words, nothing prolapses. Then take out your microcatheter. It's hard to imagine, but you know these coils do inter, um, interface and interact with each other, and they do form a complex three-dimensional structure, which can actually be fairly stable. And I like to liken it to the, the bird's nest. Several twigs, you can't imagine they can form a bird's nest, but if you put enough of them together, they can actually form a bird's nest. And then over time, of course, an utilization and vessel repair. Here's an example, a 72-year-old lady with a subarachnoid large aneurysm you can see on the non-con CT. Here it is, um, large right ICA terminus incorporating both the ACA and the MCA origins. Really hard to treat without adjunctive techniques. In this case, you can see a balloon with those two markers is placed across the M1 and carotid terminus, intermittent inflation, and then wise um, uh, selection of the coils can achieve a nice occlusion and complete occlusion of this otherwise very difficult aneurysm, which eight or nine years ago would have been very hard to treat. And it works also in small aneurysms. It's a small right sky aneurysm that was ruptured. You can see we're uh, straddling that aneurysm neck with the balloon and balloon inflation, which would have been there, can promote uh, coil introduction and a nice stable occlusion. Here's just another illustration of that technique. It's the balloon use is also very helpful in the event of aneurysm rupture during the procedure. You can inflate the balloon, effectively seal it aneurysm for rupturing. The patient, don't forget, is laying flat on the angio table. Any amount of subarachnoid hemorrhage will have an increase in endocrinal pressure, and the patient could herniate on the table while you're trying to occlude it. Having a balloon is, is um, paramount to preventing that. Inflate the balloon, proceed with colonization, and you have more time than you think in the event of that happening, 10 minutes uh, to 20 minutes in the anterior circulation, and then proceed with treating of the aneurysm. Stent-assisted coiling techniques have also revolutionized the treatment. Here's that same broad neck aneurysm we treated with a balloon earlier, and this time we're going to treat with a stent. These are the two most commonly used stents, which were first introduced 2006-2007. The Enterprise and the Neuroform, a closed and an open cell design. Newer stents, the Elvis, are more available now. Essentially, the stent, the intent of the stent is to, um, to bridge the aneurysm neck, form a scaffold, and keep the coils within the aneurysm. So we pass the aneurysm neck with a stent delivery catheter, deploy our stent. In this case is the coil through technique. Once the stent's been deployed, we go through the twines of the stent with our microcatheter, act as aneurysm, and, like, and we, as we did before, start coiling the aneurysm off. And the coil mass, the, the in situ thrombosis in the aneurysm, as well as the stent itself, will promote endothelialization across the aneurysm neck. Here's another illustration. In a slight variation of the technique, which may be used with different aneurysms, um, and the curvature of the parent vessel from which they arise is the jailing technique, which can provide the catheter a little more stability. In this case, the stent delivery catheter is positioned across the neck, but before deploying it, you first then access the aneurysm. Then the stent deployed, it keeps the catheter in position, and it allows you to proceed with coil embolization and achieve a long-term cure. Here again, the comparison of the two techniques, the coil through and the jailing, which are now commonplace. And, um, 
been widely adopted. And here's a left-sided uh, P1, P2, PC aneurysm, which is broad-based. And just looking a little bit closer, you can see it's a broad neck. Hard to imagine any coils would possibly stay in that aneurysm. How do you protect that neck, that parent vessel? You can see the yellow arrows. This is a roadmap. It's a little bit fuzzy. I apologize. But the yellow arrow is showing the microcatheter within this three millimeter aneurysm. And our stent delivery catheter is deployed from the base load of the PCA. We deploy the stent, and that can keep the coils in place. And this is just showing schematically. It's hard to see on the angiography, but our stent, as well as the coils. <coughs> now, all these techniques <coughs> were rapidly evolving between 2005 to today. In 2012, the results from the BAT, the, um, the BRAT, the Bauer ruptured aneurysm trial were available. These are patients that had ruptured aneurysms. They were um, randomized to treatment, coiling versus clipping, based on the day that they arrived, even versus odd days. And they found that along with older age and poor clinical gradient presentation, known factors to, to uh, impact outcome, surgical clipping of the aneurysm was an independent predictor of poor outcome. Major, major findings, especially coming from a center who's thought to be one of the authorities in surgical treatment, as well as in the vascular. But so that's led to, at MUOC as well as most centers, most centers that have and they should have high quality surgery and endovascular means available to them, a coil first policy, which means everything being equal on the balance, the patients do better with coiling. And since then we've even um, tried other more creative techniques, borrowing tricks from the, the vascular body literature. Here's a Y stenting technique. We place a stent and then one stent through the other one to reconstruct the bifurcation, in this case a basal artery, left PCA, right PCA stent, and that can hold the coils and protect the parent vessels. Depending on the bifurcation, it becomes an extent, and things can get more creative and more creative as you proceed. One of the things we learned from uh, stents is that in addition to holding the coils, they, they cause slow diversion. Even a stent that only has 8 to 10 percent surface area can actually change the hemodynamics within the aneurysm. So why not treat uncoilable, broad, shallow aneurysms with multiple stents? Here's an aneurysm. One stent's deployed, two stents deployed, now you have 10 to 20 percent surface area. We can see those th thrombosis over time. A little perforator adjacent to it will still siphon, but the dead end um, aneurysm will go on to occlude. And then um, this is another case where creative ways of trying to use stents to cause a flow diversion with, within a fusiform aneurysm have been attempted, and this all led to the development of introduction of flow diverters. You can see the um, older stents up top. You can see how much metal surface area there is on the pipeline device down below. In this case, for example, a fusiform aneurysm, the idea is you deploy a stent, traps the flow and stagnates flow, thrombosis starts to occur. Again, siphoning through those perforators keep those, keeps that open, and a channel forms, and endothelium uh, grows and crosses the stent, but it will remain open near the site of a perforator. Not perfect, but this is definitely one of the newer techniques. Here's an example of a large cavernous aneurysm treated with a pipeline. This does not need any coils. In fact, they can just be treated with a flow diverter. Newer techniques, newer coils, newer stents, stents that are deployed within the aneurysm entirely and not even involving the parent vessel. All these are coming up. So you might ask, why surgery? I know I'm running out of time. Just one more minute here. Yeah. Why surgery? There's still a role for surgery, although it's becoming diminishing, uh, diminishingly common. You may think surgery is antiquated and barbaric, but for example, this MC aneurysm, we take a look at it, it's incidental aneurysm. We do a three-dimensional angiogram. MCAs tend to be, the, by the way, the Achilles heel of endovascular treatment. I'll show you why. And that has to do with the fact that they tend to incorporate the vessel origins. Here you can see we've rotated this angiogram to really study anatomy. One of the branches is relatively free, but that other branch, which is smaller, is completely incorporated by the neck. Trying to preserve that area of demarcating the green is very challenging with coiling. You can see as coils come in, all you need is a little bit of uh, pouching out of the coils in the small vessel diameter, um, and it will lead to thrombosis and occlusion, as opposed to a clip, which you can contour. And the big thing is, as opposed to having a large coil mass next to the small vessel, you would actually, by singeing the aneurysm and close, you approximate endothelium to endothelium, which is not as prothrombotic. And this patient went on to have surgical clipping, did very well. And just two quick cases, uh, ruptured cases, MCAs also present a problem because it can present with large hematomas. In this case, the hematoma is not that large. You can see the right carotid, though, has some torturosity that can present a problem. And the NCA, like uh, compared to the other one, has that small vessel which is completely incorporated. So we elected to go into surgical clipping. You can see the following day, she's doing great. Just worried more about the breakfast than anything else. And in the last case, 41-year-old subarachnoid, large hematoma. This is a rare MC aneurysm, which does not incorporate the branches, which would actually be ideal for coiling with a balloon, perhaps. In this case, remember that large hematoma causing the symptoms. She underwent craniotomy, evacuation of the hematoma, and then clipping at the time. You can see vascular reconstruction. 
and then this is actually the last case, a 35-year-old large hematoma, MC aneurysm to be presumed. No time to get a CT angiogram, blown pupils, goes right to OR, um, ICH evacuation and, and uh, clipping of that MC aneurysm. So to wrap up, um, most centers, including MUC now, that can, afford, that can provide both high-quality surgery and endovascular treatment options have adopted a coil-first policy based on the ISA and the breath studies. But the surgical indications still remain, although they are uh, diminishing over time. And for me, that is a, those are aneurysms, symptomatic hematomas, which require evacuation. And then lastly, those not amenable to coil embolization, again, coiling first policy. Thank you very much. Excellent.